Jerry Witt will host a War Dogs presentation on the <laughs> south side stage at the depot station. Guests are invited to come and learn about America's War Dog heroes now. Okay, I guess we'll start. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jerry Witt, and uh, I'm from Menominee Falls, and uh, I'm part of a group called War Dogs. Uh, in World War II, uh, German Shepherds were used extensively during the war, and uh, their job consisted of sentry duty, which means that they were used for guard dog duty around command centers and posts and things of that nature. Um, they guarded airfields and so forth. A sentry dog is trained to be loud, noisy, and obviously very aggressive and taught by commands from their handler. The other dog that was used in World War II were the Doberman Pinschers. And those Doberman Pinschers were used as scout dogs in Second World War. By scout dogs, I mean that they were used to help detect the enemy if they were in various undercover positions, etc. Dogs are nothing new in the military. They've been used ever since the Romans. These particular dogs serve various purposes uh, in the military, but um, what I wanted to tell you and talk to you about today is uh, my experiences as a dog handler in Vietnam. Uh, I served in the military from uh, August, I was drafted in August of 1967, uh, and I served until May 13th, 1969. And uh, when I was drafted, I went through basic training at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And after that, I went to my advanced individual training, AIT, in, uh, excuse me, Fort Ord, California. Uh, with a couple of weeks left to go in training in Fort Ord, California, before our graduation, the CEO of the company called myself and two other guys into his office one evening. He uh, proceeded to uh, and tell us about uh, how great it would be to be a U.S. Army Ranger. And, of course, it certainly would be. But at the time, um, I was married, and uh, what, it meant, what it meant was that we would have to go through 12 weeks of survival training. And after that, we would have to uh, re-up for two more years, and it automatically meant the tour of Vietnam. Now, at the time, at the height of, of the Vietnam War, or beginning of the height of the Vietnam War, in late 67, early 68, um, our unit had heard that maybe we might be going to Germany, the whole unit, for 18 months. So <clears throat> naturally, after he spieled all of his uh, uh, benefits of being a U.S. Army Ranger, so he said, no, 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 you guys take a week and think about this, and I'll call you next week, call, call you back next week. So a week went by, and he called us back into his, into his office, and he asked us point blank, well, have you made your decision, and all three of us declined, and he abruptly dismissed us. Two days later, we had graduation, and it's always really neat, the graduation, the bands playing, the marching and everything, and after graduation, our company commander hands out the orders for where you're going to be going after this training. And, of course, my last name being Witt, um, I didn't get my orders till the very end, but I was hearing all this yelling and screaming. And by the time they got to probably like C, <laughs> we already knew what was happening. They were yelling because we were going to go to Germany for 18 months. All but three guys. <laughs> Those three guys were going to go to Fort Benning, Georgia, to scout dog training school for, for the next 12 weeks. We had absolutely no idea what we were what we were getting into. So. I asked the platoon sergeant at the time, I said, let's, let's check this out. What does this mean? 
Well, he went and got some book, and he was looking up, you know, the MOS, which means occupation. Would you want anything on it? And it meant that, well, you're going to work with the German Shepherd dog. You're going to be able to, you're going to have to train with these dogs. And your job is going to be to walk point, and with the use of the dog senses, be able to alert <coughs> the men behind you of danger that might be ahead. And I went, whoa. That's when things really got serious for me because I thought, well, you know, that's really not a really good occupation. And the military has really dumb things that they tell you. And at the end of this paragraph, it tells you, literally, your life expectancy under fire. And being a scout dog handler, it was uh, 0.5 seconds. So that, needless to say, uh, when I left there, I went home for leave, and uh, my father had been a World War II veteran. He didn't initially land on Normandy, but he was the third wave. My grandfather was in World War I, but when I went home um, and I started talking to my dad after a while, and he said, well, what do you, you know, exactly, what, what's going on? I said, well, I'm going to tell you, but I said, I appreciate it if you wouldn't say nothing to Ma or my brothers. So I told him exactly what was going to happen, what, what I was going to be doing, and he went, whoa. And he just told me, he said, well, he said, when the S hits the fan, you hit the deck and be safe. And at that time, um, he handed me something. And he went into his room, and he handed this to me. And he said that he had got this from his, from his father, who had been in World War I. And what it was was a rosary, and he carried it with him all the way through the Second World War. My father was wounded, and he gave it to me, and he said, well, he says, I'm giving this to you, and be safe. So I didn't say anything to my mom, but uh, anyways, when we left, when I left to go to, uh, to Vietnam, for the first month, we had these untrained dogs at... 50 meters, three meters apart in a line, and they were taking hand commands from us. And it was amazing what they did. It, it amazed me, and my dog that I had was a 125-pound alpha male who wanted to fight every other male that he put his eyes on. And um, anyways, uh, he and I got along really, really good, but I knew at the time <coughs> that these dogs would not be going with us to Vietnam because they have to go through the whole process twice. So when I arrived in, in Vietnam, um, I was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division, which is obviously still in existence today, and uh, was sent to a place called An Khe, Vietnam, which is up in the Central Highlands. And there was our main kennel. And, uh, our main headquarters and I was then assigned to a dog he was a black and tan dog that had been there a couple of years and his name was Skip now what hap what has to happen is that I have to work with this dog for two solid weeks uh, probably six to seven hours a day just to get to know him and the way that these dogs work are like this we would work, and we would work down a trail. We'd have people hidden in the grass or in the bush, or whatever, and we would put a harness on these dogs. And once the harness goes on the dog, they know immediately that they have to go to work. So once they, they have that, your, your command is search, search, search. And you keep your eye on the dog, and typically what happens is if the dog picks up the scent, either left behind on booby traps, tunnels, but mainly in personnel that they can that they can sniff. What usually happens is they'll stop, their nose will go up and start twitching and their ears will go straight up. At that point in time, it's my responsibility 
to read the wind, which way the wind is blowing. Because generally speaking, dogs will always pick up scent into the wind. And generally, probably 95% of the time, it's pretty easy because it's usually the way the wind is, is, uh, is coming. But sometimes it can get rather tricky, especially if you're working in the jungles of Vietnam and you're going down the, over, down the side of a mountain and the wind might be coming from your left. It'll hit the trees and actually swirl this way. So if the dog lurks this way, you have to read that wind and actually the danger is over here. So you had to be real focused. So anyways, after two weeks, we were sent up to a place called LZ Evans. LZ meaning Landing Zone Evans. And that was our forward base camp. There, we had about anywhere between 15 and 20 handlers from our unit. And our unit consisted of about 30 to 35 men. And when you get there, you're, you're ready to rock. And what usually happens is, you go there and your name goes to the bottom of the list. And when the infantry units call in, and they are in a situation where they're in the jungle, and they'll call in at night and they'll say, we need a handler because we're going through some very dangerous territory. So the guy's name that's on the top is the next one on the list, and he has to get ready. So in, in other words, he's got to get his ammo, he's got to get his equipment, and including with all of that, you got to take along a three-day supply of food for the dog. The dogs generally ate 10 Gaines burgers a day and two cans of horse meat. So your pack generally got pretty doggone heavy. Um, so then the helicopters, the choppers, would fly you out to their location, and there you would meet with the CO and find out what the mission is of the day, and they'll tell us with maps where we want to go from a, point A to point B. And uh, that's how it works. And it works for three days. We work three days, three day missions, because after that, the dog gets tired, fatigued, and so does the handler. And so we have to be flown back, and then our name goes to the bottom of the list. In my time in, in, my time in, uh, in Vietnam, I did about 37 missions altogether. And I got to tell you, um, it was very, very, it's hard to explain when you're out there in front of everybody. You know how important it is that you are doing, going to be doing your job to the best of your ability, not only to save yourself, but to save all the men behind you. So obviously I had to take, take that job very seriously. And the dog that I had, obviously, was a, known as a scout dog, and that differs from the sentry dog. So Skip and I did, um, we did approximately 22 missions. Um, and then one day, it was during the monsoon season, water and moisture washes away scent left behind on booby traps and so forth. We were walking down the trail, and Skip stopped, and he just froze, and he turned his head, and he told me, don't come any closer, I'm in trouble. And then I figured it out, he was into a tripwire. So he tried to pull back, but the wire got caught in his, either his chest hair or a harness or whatever, and it exploded. And we were, I got nicked in the leg, and we were flown down to, uh, Saigon where he underwent surgery and actually came through surgery just fine and I was so happy. Um, and after that, about three days later, um, we found out that he had incurred staph infection and, and ended up dying. And uh, it, still, it still hurts to this day and it's been 50 years. But um, I lost my partner, my best friend, and it was really hard to take. So I brought him back to our unit, our main unit in Anke, and there we had we had a cemetery for all the dogs that didn't make it. So I buried them that afternoon, 
And after that burial, the CEO called me into his office and said, Whit, he says, you need to uh, choose another dog that's available and you need to start your training this afternoon. And I thought to myself, you SOB. But you know what, I was really upset with that because he didn't even give me any kind of a chance to, to mourn. I didn't understand it then, but I do understand it now because he wanted me to get back in as soon as I can because if I waited any longer, I probably would have been so ineffective that it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked. So I get it. I get it now. I didn't get it back in the day. So I had chose a dog that was in, available because back in the day of Vietnam, you would come in country like May 13th, 1968. You'd go home May 13th, 1969. And there were people that came before me and after me and so forth. So when some one of the fellas left that had this dog, the dog was available. And I, I wanted him because I knew his reputation was one of the best in the entire platoon. He uh, had been a four-year veteran of Vietnam. Uh, he hated to be shot at, and um, he was really good, and his name was Satan. And there was a reason why his name was Satan, because uh, he was, once he w got to know you as a handler, there would literally be nobody else that could come close to you when, when he was unleashed with you or off-leash by that matter, too. So uh, it took me a couple of days of him and I having conversations to, uh, to let him know that I was going to be his handler, but I think he knew, he knew that before I did. But anyways, uh, I finally went in and, and uh, put, the, put the, you know, the harness on him, and we, we started working, and, and he kept me safe for the rest of my tour. And um, uh, 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 right after I had him, we were, <clears throat> there was another, about six weeks later, I came back from a mission and uh, I found out that uh, uh, my friend that I went to Fort Benning with was from Pulaski, Wisconsin, and he and I were always talking about getting together and seeing the Packers and so forth. But when I came in, I found out that um, he had been, they had been down for the night, they were inside the perimeter, and his dog started alerting, and he went to go check on the dog, and when he got to him, uh, as the story was told to us, uh, a sniper got both him and, and his dog. So, that was, uh, you know, the second time that I lost a, a good friend and I at that point I didn't know if I was ever going to make it back alive but somehow or another you know God kept me safe and uh, uh, it worked and I just wanted to say you know tell you this whole background because the importance of these dogs and it goes beyond Vietnam it goes into you know Iraq Afghanistan they are still being used today so dogs in the military have been a real value. And our organization, War Dogs, uh, for five years we, we tried to you know, do, do such things as fundraising and we finally were able to erect a monument in Village Park in Menominee Falls, right next to the World War II monument. And uh, we're very proud of that. So if you ever get a chance to go over there, it's right across the street from the middle school and uh, that was from our group.